Tech, I'm not convinced that this power steering pump leaks like Mr. Williams, the owner, says it does. Well, brother, that oil's coming from somewhere. How carefully have you inspected it? I wiped off the pump in the reservoir, and there doesn't seem to be any fluid getting past the reservoir seal. Bottom's dry, the engine's been running, and there's no leak at the shaft seal either. Well, here's Brad. Maybe between the two of us, we can shed some light on this problem. Hi there, Tech. Glad to see you back again. What's new? I picked up a choice bit of information the other day that just might help you fellas solve this job Fred's puzzled about. Well, far away, Tech. We're listening. An owner was complaining about his power steering, no assist and the like, and always having to add fluid. Carry on, Tech. I think I know what you're going to say. And along with that, he said he had to have his car pushed almost every morning to get started. We found he hadn't had his car prepared for cold weather operation. We also found out that because he lives near the corner, he has to make several turns before he can get his car in a straightaway for a good push to get started. With the engine not running, the fluids not being circulated normally through the system. When the steering wheels turned, the piston forces the fluid up into the reservoir, raising the level. And as a result, the fluid spews out through the vent hole in the filler cap, right? You named it, Brad. So... Fluid spills all over the pump. Every time the owner lifts the hood and sees the wet pump, he figures the pump is leaking. And if that happened very often, he'd have to add fluid quite frequently. Say, come to think about it, Mr. Williams wants us to check this car for hard starting, too. He had to get a push yesterday morning. I wouldn't doubt, but that's the reason for the fluid on the outside of this pump. I'll put some fluid in the pump right now, start the engine, and turn the wheel from one extreme to the other a few times to expel the air. Then I'll clean the pump and look it over again to be sure it isn't leaking. If you don't find a leak, I'll explain the cause of this condition to the owner so he'll understand what happens when he turns the steering wheel when the engine isn't running. And remember, if the reservoir or shaft seals leak, they can be replaced. In fact, all external leaks can usually be repaired. You don't have to replace the complete pump. You know, Fred, I wish more technicians would do a better job of diagnosing power steering troubles. From what I've seen and heard, too many fellas want to pull the pump, and if that doesn't do the trick, out comes the gear. Which means he spends some of the customer's money unnecessarily, when he probably could have sold him some service work he actually needed. You've got a good point there, Tech. If we take more interest in showing how we can save the customer money on maintenance costs, we'll gain his confidence and get more of his service work in the long run. Say, Brad, while you're in the mood, why don't we run through this diagnosis business on power steering conditions? It might help us all. Sounds like a good suggestion, Brad. How about it? Okay, fellas. Well, the first thing to do is wipe off the filler neck cap so we don't get any dirt in the system. Then we'll examine the fluid level to be sure it's up to the lower end of the neck when the fluid is cold. And if the fluid's hot, the level should be about halfway up in the neck. Which reminds me, we won't be using automatic transmission fluid type A in power steering units any longer. We'll use nothing but this new power steering fluid. I've heard something about that. Uh, what's the story? Well, this new fluid was developed exclusively for power steering units because it extends the life of all power steering rubber parts, uh, particularly the hoses. Okay, I'll remember that. What's next? Well, the next step is to be sure the pump belt tension is set up to specifications for the model car you're working on. You can always do a better job if you use a torque wrench instead of guessing at the tension. On models using the pump with the automatic belt tensioner, the job can best be done if the torque wrench adapter is used to set up the initial tension. Oh, sure, I, I always set it that way. And in addition to covering the preliminary steps that should be performed when diagnosing power steering complaints, Let's review the pressure test procedures, too. What uh, particular complaint are we going to cover, Brad? Well, let's take uh, lack of assist, for example. Pressure tests should always be made whenever an owner reports lack of assist. That will help us get right to the source of the trouble. Sounds good to me, Brad. Now, what you need to understand is what the various tests indicate and the meaning of low and high pressure readings under certain operating conditions. When you know that, you can put your finger right on the trouble zone. That's the point, Tech. Let's hook up the test hose and the shutoff valve and gauge and turn the shutoff valve to the fully open position. 
Then, start the engine and set the idle speed at 500 RPM. This applies to all models. Use a tachometer to get an accurate setting. Run the engine until the fluid in the pump reservoir reaches a temperature of 150 to 170 degrees. You can test it by sticking a thermometer in the pump filler neck, Fred. That's a good suggestion, Tech. When the fluid warms up to the correct temperature, the pressure gauge reading on all constant control units should be 55 to 80 pounds per square inch, with hands off the steering wheel. The other pressure readings for this car and all other models are shown in this reference book, Fred. They're all together. That's fine. Now, if the pressure is higher than I mentioned, it indicates some restriction in the system. It might be in the hoses, so look for kinks and obstructions. In addition, there might be an obstruction in the return screen at the pump. It might be in one of the gear passages, or the back pressure valve might not be working properly. Next, I'll increase the engine speed to 1,000 RPM and slowly close the shutoff valve. On this Plymouth, when the valve is fully closed, the gauge reading should be between 850 and 950 pounds per square inch. Fred, uh, be sure you don't hold that valve closed for more than a few seconds. Otherwise, you'll heat up the fluid and cause extra pump wear. I've learned my lesson on that one. What's next, Brad? Well, if the pressure rises to more than 950 pounds per square inch, the relief valve is not opening when it should. Maybe the wrong relief valve has been installed. If the pressure reading is less than 850 pounds per square inch, the relief valve may be opening too soon. In addition, the flow control valve may be stuck open or the pump may not be meeting specifications. If the pressure is okay at 1000 RPM, drop the speed to 500 RPM. Momentarily close the shutoff valve. Pressure should remain about the same as at 1000 RPM. If it doesn't, inspect the flow control valve for freedom of operation. Also, inspect the relief valve installation to see that it is sealing properly with its gasket. If these valves are satisfactory, the trouble's probably due to internal wear, and the pump should be replaced by using the pump replacement package. That's right, Fred. And be sure the proper puller is used when removing the pulley from the old pump. Right. And remember to transfer the old relief valve to the new pump. Also, be sure to install the new O-ring and seal between the pump and the reservoir. These parts are included in the pump replacement package. I understand. Now, if tests indicate the pump is okay, we'd test the gear next, wouldn't we? Right. With the engine running at 1,000 RPM and the shutoff valve open, have a helper turn the steering wheel from one extreme to the other, holding the wheel momentarily when he reaches the end of the turn. The gauge readings at each extreme should be the same and should be within the range of the relief valve. If they aren't, it indicates excessive internal leakage in the gear unit or an improperly operating spool valve. If the owner had reported sticky steering, wandering, or lack of returnability, look for a tight cross shaft adjustment or worn idler arm bushing before you pull the valve housing or gear. If these points are okay, remove and examine the spool valve and the housing for nicks, burrs, and score marks. If there are any fine scratches or burrs, they can generally be polished off with crocus cloth, but don't round off the edges on the spool or housing. If the valve is too badly scored or burred, replace it and the housing. Be sure to use new valve housing O-rings and gaskets when the valve is reassembled and installed on the unit. Oh, uh, before we use any more of this record, uh, somebody better turn it over. Brad, what's that story on the power steering cross shaft oil seal snap ring you started telling me about the other day? Well, if you install that ring incorrectly in its groove so that the side with the sharp edge is facing inward instead of outward, it may snap out of its groove and result in an oil leak. Is there a fix for it? Oh, yes. On all cars except Valiant and Lancer, a new snap ring is now used in production and should be used for service. It's identified by a number... W-168, stamped on the side with the sharp edge. Here's one. Oh, yeah, I see. It's got to be installed with the numbered sharp side facing outward, huh? Right. That way, the ring seats firmly in its groove. 
Now, don't ever reinstall the old snap ring. Always use a new one. And be sure the side with a sharp edge is facing outward. Speaking of power steering, that car we had in last week with a report of a chuckling noise in the gear when driving over railroad tracks or rough roads, that sure was a stickler. It gave you a little rough time, eh, Fred? It sure did, Tech. I checked the cross shaft adjustment and found it okay. Then Brad rocked the steering wheel and shaft in the housing and located the looseness in the steering tube coupling. What did you find, Brad? Those plastic inserts and the insulator were damaged, allowing looseness in the coupling. And even if they were in good condition, but the insulator happened to be a little undersized, it would cause looseness and result in the same complaint. Yeah, when we installed the new parts, we made sure one of the inserts was assembled on each side of the rubber insulator and that the nipples on the insulator passed through the holes in the inserts to hold them in position. Remember, when these parts are assembled on the blade end of the steering tube, about 3 to 15 pounds pressure should be required to push the parts into the coupling. Our first try was pretty loose because the insulator was a bit undersized. So we put an extra insert on one side. That took care of the trouble. Since we're talking about steering gears, I'd like to review a case we had the other day that involved the manual steering gear on a Valiant. It's the same gear that's used on Lancer models. The owner reported that it took a lot of effort to steer the car and that it had a tendency to wander. Well, we looked for the usual causes, such as uneven and low tire pressures, lack of lubrication of the gear and linkage, the cross shaft adjustment and front end alignment. Finally, we tested the steering gear with the linkage disconnected and the cross shaft adjustment backed off. We found the torque required to move the steering shaft was higher than the two to five inch pound specified. Someone had set up the worm bearing preload too high. We loosened the lock nut and readjusted the worm bearing adjuster. Isn't the correct cross shaft adjustment just as important on manual steering gears as on power steering gears? You bet it is, Fred. It can cause hard steering and tendency to wander on either gear. Brad, here's something I'd like to pass on to both you and Fred about front suspension. You can do your owners a real service if you'll replace damaged control arm ball joint seals on Valiant and Lancer models when you're working on front ends. That'll help keep road dirt out of the ball joints. Well, thanks, Tech, but we always do that. And we don't take any chances when we install them. We use the seal installer to avoid tearing the seal and damaging the metal retainer. We've seen some pretty sad-looking seals that sure weren't put in with the correct tool. While we're talking about the front suspension on Valiant and Lancer models, we ought to keep in mind that when removing a torsion bar, it's important to use the torsion bar removing tool to avoid scoring the bar. Right. And I found that the tool has to be really tight on the bar. If it isn't, it will slip and score the bar. If the bar gets scored, use crocus cloth to polish the damaged area and then paint it with rust preventive paint to guard against corrosive action. When installing the bar, be sure that the balloon type seal is placed on the bar with the cupped side to the rear. Both ends of the bar must be coated with multi-purpose grease, of course. In addition, the annular opening in the rear anchor must be packed with the same kind of grease before the lip of the seal is engaged in the groove in the anchor. If that's done right, it's pretty sure to keep road dirt and salt out of the anchor so corrosion will not take place. Here's something else that's important on torsion bars for all models. Use only Chrysler Corporation pre-stressed bars for replacement purposes. Bars are stamped on the anchor end with a three-digit number. If the last digit is an odd number, that bar is for the left side. If the last digit is an even number, that bar is for the right side. And we've got to keep in mind those bars are not interchangeable from side to side. That's because they're stressed for right and left side use. Brad, have you hit on anything new lately on front end alignment? Well, nothing exactly new tech, but uh, something worth talking about. Camber has been increased one eighth degree on all 1961 models. All other specifications remain the same as before. Before adjusting caster and camber, it's important that car front height be corrected first. Correct caster and camber readings cannot be obtained unless the car height is correct. Incidentally, when setting car front height on Valiant and Lancer models, 
always work toward the maximum rather than minimum tolerance. Specs call for one and three quarters inches plus or minus one eighth inch. In other words, a reading of one and seven eighths inches is preferred to a reading of one and five eighths inches. When adjusting front end alignment, I carefully look over the condition of the cam adjusting rubber bushings, lower control arm shaft bushings, and in particular, the lower control arm strut bushings. Occasionally, I have to replace them before I can get the correct readings. If there is any looseness or deterioration in these bushings, or looseness of the nut on the front of the strut, this can frequently cause the brakes to pull to one side. Those are good tips, Fred. I hope Tech passes them on to some of the other technicians he calls on. Now, here's a rear shock absorber condition that might turn up on early 61 models, except Valiants, Lancers, and Imperials. The customer thinks he's got bad shocks, but the trouble is actually in the mountings. For example, the shoulder on the upper shock absorber mounting stud interferes with the body sheet metal. Tightening the stud nut has no effect. The only solution is to remove the stud and cut the shoulder back 3 sixteenths of an inch. Then reinstall it. Brad, I wish we had more time to talk about that thorough inspection job you fellows do on adjustment and tightening of the steering and linkage on your new cars when you prepare them for delivery. I'd like to pass that along to some of the boys. Well, thanks, Tech. That's quite a long story. It's all outlined in the reference book here, so technicians who are interested in reducing their steering and front-end complaints can benefit from it. Well, I've picked up some good tips in steering and suspension from you guys, and I'll pass them along. Much obliged. Well, I'll be on my way. See you soon. Mm -hmm.